Well, it says we're live. Hello, everyone. It's uh, Tuesday, 4 o'clock Pacific, 6 o'clock Central here in Costa Rica also, 6 o'clock Central, 7 o'clock on the East Coast, uh, New York and Florida, uh, midnight in Dublin and London, 1 a.m. in Italy and most of Europe, uh, 8, 9.30 a.m. Wednesday morning in Australia. I think it's 3 in the afternoon, 3 or 3.30 in the afternoon in New Zealand, and it's Facebook Live. And usually the first Tuesday of the month is with Michelle Ross, but we have a very special guest today. And so Michelle and I will be together next week. And our guest is a little bit late getting here. So I'm just going to start off with all you guys and say hello and bring up uh, uh, my Facebook live here on my phone to say hello to everyone and and um, scrolling down and going through all that. In the meantime, you can start sending in questions and we'll get started with any questions you have until our guest arrives. Uh, but in the meantime, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Did you ever watch that um, uh, rolling, 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 the cowboy show? Uh, there we go, there's Dr. Axe. Uh, uh, great, great, so I'm still pulling up uh, on my phone so I can say hello to everyone. So give me just a moment here. And it says we're live, there we go. All right. Hi, Dr. X. Oh, I can't hear you, man. I think your your sound is off. There we go. Hey, Dr. There Tom, how you doing? Really well, really nice to see you again. Really nice. Yeah, good to see you too. Yeah, yeah, it's been, uh, I think about a year and a half since we've, we've spoken or, or connected with each other. And yeah heard a lot about what you've been doing in the meantime, and thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. Yeah, and, thanks for having me. Oh, of course. And it's a big day. It's a big day because it's the launch of your new book today. And that's really great that we get to be um, with you on the day that the book launches. So, so thanks so much for that. Yeah, well, hey, again, thanks for having me. I'm always excited about it. I know you and I both, both share a passion of helping people transform their health and so excited about uh, talking about how to do that today. Yeah, you bet. You bet. So I'm going to start with a little intro of you. For those who don't know you, if there is anyone out there in the world that doesn't. <laughs> but Dr. Josh Axe, um, he's a go-to guy. You know, we've known each other for many, many years. Our paths were somewhat similar in our beginning in healthcare. We both went through chiropractic education and some nutritional education and then Dr. Axe went into traditional Chinese medicine and spent a lot of time there learning more about the history of healthcare going back literally thousands of years. Um, so I've got a little bit to read to you about him. Let me just bring that up. He's the founder of Ancient Nutrition and DrAxe.com. That's D-R-A-X-E.com. He's the author, <coughs> excuse me, of the best-selling books, Keto Diet and Collagen Diet. And the new book that comes out today is Ancient Remedies. So it's just a thrill to be talking about ancient remedies. You know, Dr. X, one of my first mentors was Dr. George Goodhart and uh, the founder oh, yeah. of Applied Kinesiology. And I spent hundreds of hours with George and, and he would continually say that those truths that are just grounded in reality and that work again and again, they keep coming back every 20 years, every 30 years, and then the people who study it, they lose it for a while, or they go into the background because new people are coming up, new books come out, emphasis in a different area, but then that same information comes back again. Now, I can't think of any information more relevant than ancient wisdom that's been around for a long time. So can you tell us a little of what called you to this topic of ancient wisdom? Yeah, absolutely. So for myself, you know, I, I got in the field of sort of natural medicine and health like you did, Dr. Tom. Uh, one, because it was a passion of mine that really developed from when I was younger. You know, growing up, my family lived in the traditional medical model. Anytime we were sick, we took drugs. We didn't know there was a natural way. And I had a mom who had cancer at 41 years old. And so I saw her go through all the treatments, everything from chemotherapy and surgeries, having a vasectomy. And she made it through that. But 
uh, as cancer free. But the crazy thing was, it seemed like she was sicker than ever. My mom, I uh, got put on several medications. And growing up, my mom was tired all the time, was depressed all the time, and just sick all the time. And that's really what led me to say, hey, I want to I want to start learning about nutrition, I want to start learning about ancient remedies and how to heal. And my mom was diagnosed with cancer again, about six months before I opened up my functional medicine clinic in Nashville. And wow. she called me and she said, I've just been diagnosed with cancer again. What do I do? I said, Mom, I'll be home, flew home. And we just we decided to take care of her all naturally. We started, you know, juicing vegetables, consuming superfoods like reishi mushroom and turmeric and radically changed her diet. And after four months, went back to the oncologist, read a CT scan and the tumors had shrunk in half, went back nine months later, complete remission. And today my mom is in her late sixties. She's in the best shape of her life. And, um, you know, and so, you know, in fact, recently she brought my niece and nephew to Disney world and she was there like 12 hours, which I don't even think I could do that. But <laughs> all that being brutal. said, <laughs> yeah. So, so she, but that's really what led me, you know, when my mom was sick, it led me to do all this research. And I was, I was researching medical studies on, uh, you know, ancient remedies or Chinese remedies for, for, for cancer and other things that I started coming across all these amazing uh, studies on mushrooms, like reishi mushroom and cordyceps and maitake. I started coming across all this great research on turmeric and galangal, uh, on certain essential oils like myrrh and frankincense. It just, it was surprising to see all of the great research, especially in areas like Israel and Japan and other areas of Asia. So all that being said, it was my mom's health crisis that led me to that. And then I started using it with patients and learning more and more and seeing, you know what, this is a great way to start addressing the root cause of disease. Because Dr. Tom, you and I both know today, the medical system is just treating people with drugs or surgery, in fact, making them worse versus what we're able to do by changing lifestyle with nutrition, lifestyle, you know, using herbal supplementation, we're able to better address the root cause and help people completely heal. That's really a great story of how you got in. I, I fully agree with everything you said. And I'm, I'm um, uh, in awe, I guess I'd say, that you open your practice and in the first few months, your mom's diagnosed. And so that demanded of you right away not to be a neophyte doctor and be wishy-washy and think, well, maybe this can help or maybe this won't. You had to do the deep dive to save your mom's life. Yeah. I'm lying. Way yeah. to go, man. Way to go. And that 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 just launched you from that powerful beginning, you know, in that in those first months of practice, from that powerful beginning. And I'm sure you experimented with some of the mushrooms on different patients with different conditions and different herbs with different conditions, and you saw again and again, the results of that. I'm assuming that's what happened. Well, yeah, one of the things that happened is, you know, and I absolutely use them with patients, but you know, I had, there's so much guidance in traditional Chinese medicine, you know, they, they would say, we'll use mushrooms, for example, if you have a lung issue where your lungs are weak, you want to take cordyceps. If you have an issue with your adrenal glands, you want to take reishi mushroom. If you have an issue with a virus, turkey tail has incredible antiviral properties. If you have an issue with your brain, lion's mane mushroom is so powerful at supporting brain regeneration. So based on those different conditions, Conditions, I would prescribe those things and similar thing with herbals. If somebody had inflammation, I would prescribe uh, turmeric and ginger and other herbs like galangal and skullcap used in Chinese medicine. If somebody had hormone imbalance related to progesterone estrogen, I'd recommend the herb Vitex. And for women that are postmenopausal, black cohosh for anemia, Don Kwai for low energy, ginseng, and for hypothyroidism, ashwagandha, and astragalus for any sort of digestive issue or immune related condition. So all of these are part of you know uh, Asian, Asian medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, and some in Ayurveda, obviously like the ashwagandha. But yeah, I would start to prescribe those to, uh, those herbs. And I was just so surprised by the results. One of the other things, Tom, that's crazy to think about, up until 100 years ago, when somebody used the word medicine, they actually meant herbs and spices. It's really a phenomenon in the past 100 years, because even our medications today, a lot of the ideas for them are taken from plant-based compounds. For instance, the active compound in uh, wintergreen or white willow bark is actually where they got the idea for aspirin. Now today they make it synthetically, but it's, you know, all the, these ideas for even medications came from plants, only the plants don't have all the side effects.
Right, right. I know it's, it's, it's jaw dropping. And, and when we were young in practice, uh, young of age, we're still young of heart. Uh, but when, when we were young of age, we'd see these results and we'd be so excited and just be, be looking forward to the next problem that came in so that we could yeah. use more of this and get those kinds of results. Uh, Dr. Josh, in, um, in this Facebook Live, I always do shout outs of people who are here. So bear with, me, bear with me for a minute. And then I, there's, yeah. already a, there's a ton of questions here, but let's start with Amanda. It was the first one on today. She says, thank you so much for your time and dedication from Amanda in Sydney, Australia. And it's 11 a.m. Thank you, Amanda. Glad, good to know it's 11 a.m. And team, help me remember next week. It's 11 a.m. Wednesday morning in Australia. Uh, let's see. Uh, Shaquila says, hi, Doc. Can you recommend any natural antivirals and how to take them to help viruses and putting them into remission? So, Dr. Josh, let's start there with that first question. Yeah, so with viruses, you know, there, there are certain antivirals that I really like. Uh, I mentioned one earlier, and that is turkey tail mushroom. Turkey tail has an incredible has incredible benefits at specifically fire, fighting viruses. Now, if we're also talking about things related to the lungs, I like thyme. Okay, the same the same herb you'd cook with in your kitchen today. Thyme has amazing antiviral benefits, and it's also good for your lung. There's also an herbal in Chinese medicine that was frequently used for viruses. Uh, and it's actually called andrographis. And in, in Chinese medicine, it was known as king of the bitters. That's another very good one. And a few others I like. I also like elderberry and echinacea. You know, elderberry has more of an immune boosting properties, but also has a little bit of antiviral properties and similar thing with echinacea. So I would say if you're looking to fight a virus, echinacea, elderberry, andrographis, turkey tail mushroom, those are absolutely some of the best. And, and listen, there are a lot with some antiviral properties, but those are some of my favorites when we're talking about issues related to the immune system. When we're talking about herbs like thyme, you referenced thyme. Now, ancient wisdom, well, was the ancient wisdom that people would use a little thyme in their cooking on a regular basis? They grow mm -hmm. in their gardens and maybe on the window shelf, you know, and, uh, a little window garden in today's world, but using some fresh herbs like that, will that give us some of the benefits, not as much maybe as the concentration, uh, but in terms of using fresh spices, is that helpful? It's, it's super helpful. In fact, here, here's something that's interesting. If you go over to Eastern countries, if you go over to uh, the Middle East, like an area like Israel, if you go to India, if you go to Asia, whether it's Ch China or Japan, they use a lot of herbs and spices in their cooking. In fact, herbs and spices, it's most true. When people say food is medicine, if those are food, they are the strongest of all the foods in terms of their, their medicinal properties. And so all that being said, you know, they, they use a lot. We, we don't use a lot in America or even Europe as much. We, we use less spices. We should be using more spices. So yes, be generous in your cooking and that you're going to get a lot of benefits that way, especially in terms of prevention, keeping inflammation low, blood sugar more balanced. But if somebody is looking to use something that's more medicinal in strength, actually typically the way it was consumed throughout history was in a tea form. Uh, and so, so tea was sort of how people took their supplements uh, throughout history. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. So for those who have never tried using fresh herbs in your cooking, if you try planting, you know, in little little pots on the windowsill, grow a little parsley, grow a little thyme, grow a little rosemary, and it's so simple. You just pick off some leaves and maybe do this in the food, and that's all it takes. And you're getting the freshest, most organic, and it's just a little thing, you know, but and Dr. Josh, my, my theme uh, in life for people is base hits win the ball game. And, you know, and it's all the little things you do like that. So when we have an expert like Dr. Axe here saying time to help your lungs, it'd be great if you start thinking, I'm going to grow some time. Maybe it's going to help this much for my family. Okay, thanks for that one. <laughs> um, Let's see, I can't, my phone's not picking it up. So I'll go to the chat room here. Uh, Mary Henley asks, beneficial herbs for fatty liver. Okay. Yeah, for fatty, 
for fatty liver, I milk thistle is going to be at the very top of the list. Well, the reason is, is, is fatty liver disease. Uh, you typically want to support both cleansing, but also regeneration of the tissue. And so milk thistle has been shown in clinical studies uh, to have a really unique compound called silmarin, which actually causes liver regeneration. So that one is absolutely fantastic. I want to mention a few others here as well. Diet is very important with fatty liver disease. You want to consume a diet that is very high in plants, mostly vegetables, a lot of green leafy vegetables, artichokes and beets. Okay. So green leafy vegetables, asparagus, celery, all of that stuff, beets and artichokes. Also things like apples are very good. Granny Smith apples are going to be good for that. And if you're going to consume meat, chicken broth, wild caught fish, and a little bit of chicken is sort of your best bet. But that with vegetables and a little bit of, you could do whole grains like a sprouted rice cooked in a long time in a crock pot. You don't want to do gluten, but just something like a sprouted grain rice would be fine as well. But that sort of diet that's very clean. You actually, I don't say this with everybody, but with a fatty liver disease, you do want to go, you don't want to go low fat or you don't want to go high fat either. You just want to, if you get fat, it's a little bit of olive oil. It's a little bit of coconut oil, but then outside of that, it's a lot of vegetables, wild, you know, rices, wild organic meat. That's sort of the diet there. But I would say milk thistles at the top of the list. Then turmeric would also be very, very good. And then, um, yeah, I mean, th th those are really the big ones. I think milk, milk thistle and turmeric. Um, and there's also like, yeah, I think if you follow the diet and do that, that's going to get you a long way. I, I would agree 100% with that. Um, Sharon says, I heard you say you are keto. I didn't think that was healthy long term. Well, actually, personally, I, here, here's what happened. I, I wrote a book on keto uh, because I wanted to teach people how to do the keto diet the right way. And listen, I actually think, I don't think of keto as a diet. I think of the keto as a cleanse. I think of it's, it's something you do for a period of time, actually to support regeneration of your pancreas. <clears throat> Let me give you an example of this. Different organ systems have to deal with different macronutrients. So your liver and gallbladder deal with fat. Your stomach deals with your stomach and a little bit of your liver and a little bit of your kidneys. Those systems really deal with protein. Well, your pancreas has to deal with carbohydrate absorption. And if your pancreas is overwhelmed, if you go on a keto diet, your body is better able to heal itself. That's the important thing to remember. Foods don't heal you, the body heals itself. And so for so many people, the number one macronutrient we overconsume today is carbohydrates by far. So the number of people today that are insulin resistant due to over carbohydrate consumption. So what keto does is it gives your body an alternate form of energy via fat. It also gives your pancreas a complete break so it can literally regenerate. That's why the keto diet is most beneficial for issues that are related to insulin. And so, you know, whether it be diabetes, <coughs> diabetes, or even a lot of neurological conditions, they even call Alzheimer's type three diabetes. If you have insulin issues after the pancreas, the first organ system that's affected typically is the brain and certain other hormones or other areas of your hormonal system. So anyways, all that being said, I, I'm not on the keto diet. I've done the keto diet for periods of time when I really wanted to give my pancreas a rest and support fat loss. But I think really 30 to 90 days is the length of time someone should do keto. It is not a lifetime diet. My lifetime diet is what I cover in my new book, Ancient Remedies, which is really using food as medicine. Here's the other thing. I don't believe there's one perfect diet for anybody. I believe that we're all wired differently. Because let me ask everybody this. Have you ever had a friend do a diet and they saw these great results and you tried the exact same way of eating and it did not work for you? And so not to say, hey, not to say that there aren't certain patterns, right? We should all be getting, you know, vegetables. We should all be getting antioxidants. We should all be getting, you know, certain amount of pro some protein. But I do think, again, keto, people that have diabetes, neurological disease and need to lose a lot of body fat. That's a great diet for a period of time. But for somebody with fatty liver disease, for instance, that's a, that's, that's a, that would be a bad diet for them. So again, I think there, it, we really are in this case, looking at more of a personalized diet and approach is what I recommend. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And one of the uh, dangers, and I always talk about this, and I'll take the opportunity here too, again, uh, about doing a keto diet. A keto can be very cleansing 
and it can be very relaxing and healing for your pancreas and your body calms down and from a lot of its inflammation. The danger is if you have um, intestinal permeability, the leaky gut, and if you have elevated levels of lipopolysaccharides or LPS already in your bloodstream. Now LPS and people who watch this know it very well, LPS is the exhaust of bacteria in your gut, of gram negative, not the good guys, the bad guys in your gut. And the exhaust of that is LPS. If that gets into your bloodstream to a level where you lose tolerance to that exhaust, it's called um, a loss of to oral tolerance and you make antibodies to LPS. So on a blood test, if you have elevated antibodies to LPS, you've crossed the line of tolerance and you don't want to encourage more LPS getting into your bloodstream because that is the mechanism for what kills 250,000 people a year in the US, it's called sepsis, is just accumulated LPS over many, many years in your tissue. Why am I telling you all that? Because one of the common ways that LPS gets into your bloodstream, even if you don't have a leaky gut, but you may, you may not, is called lipid raft transcytosis. Lipid, fats, raft, like a boat. So the LPS jumps on the back of fat molecules and goes right in through your tissue into the bloodstream. So if you're doing a high fat diet, which keto is, it's a high fat diet. And if you already have elevated levels of LPS in your bloodstream, you're gonna make it worse. So in the short term, you may feel really good. You may lose some weight, get that beach body back that you want for the summer, you know, or whatever, get your brain working better, which is great. But in the long term, you're accumulating more LPS in your bloodstream. So with all of that said, what do you do? You do a simple blood test. The wheat zoomer is a great test for that because it looks for LPS antibodies. Not only does it look for wheat sensitivity, it also looks for the markers of intestinal permeability including LPS antibodies. So that's the only caution I recommend with a keto diet um, that you, you, you must make sure you haven't already crossed that line of tolerance. Uh, Kat says, uh, can you settle the age old question about cruciferous veggies and thyroid issues, also soy and thyroid? We've been told for decades that they're both no-nos. Is this true? So, so here, here's, what, here's what I would say is, one, I think the biggest issue is raw cruciferous vegetables and, and that th therein lies the biggest issue. And so a lot of foods are not meant to be consumed completely raw. They're meant to be cooked. So know that when you cook cruciferous vegetables, that risk, that, that the, the amount of what you're concerned about goes down dramatically. Um, am I, now, do I think you should be eating large? your entire, all your vegetables, cruciferous vegetables cooked. No, I think you need to mix in others, okay? And that they're only a portion if you have thyroid disease. But I think if you have thyroid disease and you are well steaming your cauliflower and your kale and some of those cruciferous foods, you're going to be just fine. Now, in regards to soy, you know, obviously there's some other issues there with, with being phytoestrogens, but also if you're doing a fermented soy-like product, those are gonna go down as well if it's fermented like a natto, or miso, and you're getting a lower dose. When you're doing miso and natto, you're only eating a, such a small amount, it's not gonna affect you as well. So the big thing I would say is, yes, I, in fact, I, I don't think raw cruciferous vegetables are really healthy for anybody, for the most part. I mean, if you're doing a small amount of kale because it's much lower than the other cruciferous vegetables, you're probably fine. But a lot of this, you gotta remember, it's just, it's, yeah, it, it, your body can handle a small amount. It can't handle too much. And so in that case, I just think you got to cook your cruciferous vegetables well. Um, and, and I think you'll be just fine. I um, Obviously, we, we have a ton of questions, but I want to keep coming back to the book. And the link is here for everyone to order the book that comes out today. It's so great. It's out now. Uh, and Dr. Josh, what, what will people learn from this book that they may not have learned already from other great books that have come out? Yeah, I would say two things. One, this is the ultimate book to help you 
heal the root cause of disease. I go through the entire book, how to actually get to the root cause. And then how to use food as medicine for you in a personalized manner. And so there's even a quiz in there where you can find out what type you are. It's called the five elements quiz. It's, it's an ancient form of Asian medicine where you get to discover your type and there's better foods for you based on your type. But let me give you an example with the root cause. And this is something that I know, you know, uh, Dr. Tom, you and I both really understand the practice of when somebody goes in with hypothyroidism today, most doctors say, Hey, here's a medication like Synthroid and you're going to be on it the rest of your life. What they don't tell those patients at the same time is it depletes their body of vitamin B1, vitamin B12, magnesium, all these nutrients. And now they're at greater risk of other medical conditions. Uh, what an ancient practitioner does and what I teach people in the book is here's what the root cause of hypothyroidism according to ancient medicine. According to ancient Asian medicine, they called it a chi and yang deficiency, which might sound like weird terms, but it's just a different language. Chi is essentially your adrenal battery, okay? It's, imagine the battery on your phone, cellular phone. What's it at right now? 80%, 60%, 30%. So based on where that's at, that actually helps fuel the thyroid for one. And then you have this other thing that's really a balance of certain hormones like melatonin and cortisol or progesterone and estrogen. And those need to be balanced where human growth hormone it's a hormone that supports regeneration needs to be at a certain level. So hypothyroidism is your adrenal battery is low for the most part. Uh, some hormonal markers are off. And then if it's Hashimoto's thyroiditis, there's an immune factor related to gut. Okay. There's actually, so let's use Hashimoto's for example, if we're healing the root cause, it's a, actually, it's not a thyroid. It doesn't start as a thyroid issue. It starts as a gut an adrenal issue. So we have to heal those organ systems. So in the book, I go through, okay, here are the best foods for the adrenals. It's berries. It's wild caught seafood like salmon. It's, it's seaweed. It's these foods are really regenerative and strengthening to the adre adrenals. And then I get into the herbs for them, such as ashwagandha, uh, rhodiola rosea, holy basil, reishi mushroom, all of these things help strengthen their adrenals. And then we get into the gut. So those foods are going to be foods that are easily digestible forms of fiber, like cooked vegetables, even things like pumpkin, and then also doing bone broth, right? Chicken bone broth, getting lots of collagen. That's going to help that. And then from a herbal standpoint, it's astragalus, it's licorice root, it's ginger, and it's probiotics, okay? And so when you follow that diet like that, that helps you get to the root cause and heal the gut lining, heal the adrenals, and that's going to allow your thyroid to function better. And then also there's an emotional component to hypothyroidism, and that's not turning it off or unplugging. It's actually related to the emotion of the two emotions, anxiety and fear. Okay, so helping overcome those emotions. And I get into exactly how to do that in the book with a five step process. All that being said, that's what the book is. And really, it's simple and easy. I know that might have sounded complex, but really, I say if you have hypothyroidism, here's the exact foods to eat, the exact supplements to take. I take, I have meal plans, I have the supplement plan in there, I have 80 recipes to where people can just follow it exactly. And boom, they're going to see great results. And I know you've seen this, Dr. Tom, as I have. I have had hundreds and hundreds of patients in the past reverse their hypothyroidism, reverse autoimmune disease, reverse, you know, infertility and, and, and get pregnant and see all of these great results. And so in the book, I go through how to do all that. Also, there's a reference index in the back with over 70 conditions. So you can use it forever you know, over the years. You'll, you'll grab it all the time and look, okay, I've got a cold. What do I take? Okay. I've got a, my kid has a rash. What do I take? And I want to mention too. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm so excited about this book. They have a big sale on it on Amazon right now. People could just go on and search Dr. Axe ancient remedies or click the link there. But uh, anyways, it's really a book about treating the root cause and using food as medicine. You know, I mentioned Dr. Goodhart earlier, my first mentor, and when he talked about thyroid, always, rule of thumb, always, you have to address hypoadrenia first. And the way you yep. just described it, it's like a cell phone battery. Are you at 30%? I mean, people will understand that much better than they understand a term like hypoadrenia. There you go. You know, your battery's at 30%. You need to plug in. Well, how do I do that? Well, you take these herbs, you eat these foods, and you're, you're recharging the battery. That's a great visual for people. And, and uh, thanks, thanks for bringing that one. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Amy asks, are there binders for oxalates and gluten? 
would your wheat rescue or E3 Advanced Plus help? Okay, the binders question on oxalates. Yeah, so um, so she's asking, are there are, are there uh, binders in four four oxalates and four gluten? Well, he, here's the thing about binders. I want to say, and this, and Dr. Tom, feel free to jump in here too. I think one of the issues you have with binders, and if, when you're talking about binders, if you're referring referring to charcoal, which is frequently consumed as a binder, even bentonite clay, and of course there's zeolites too, which which are they're going to act in a different way though. I don't know that those are going to bind to gluten. I think that's going to be more metals and other things. So anyways, my answer is, here's the thing to know about charcoal. Cause I know a lot of people are on a charcoal kick for a while. Charcoal is meant for dealing with more other forms of toxins. Charcoal kind of binds to everything, including minerals in your body. That's why I leave it back you up and cause constipation because a lot of the herbs that support, uh, or a lot of the minerals that support gut motility are actually bound to it. And so now they're not supporting your gut motility. So anyways, I don't really, and I actually don't really think it works like that. My, my advice to you is just stay away from gluten altogether. I think with oxalates and other things, whether it's saponins or other, or phytic acid or enzyme inhibitors, when we're talking about some of these different compounds, I think that if you are going to consume a food, let's talk about grains, for example, they should be sprouted and then they should be cooked for a very long time. By doing that, you actually really break down those phytic, phytic acid and some of these other enzyme inhibitors and some of these other things. Now, in terms of oxalates, if we're, and if we're also talking about uh, you know, the nightshade family, in that case, if you have severe inflammation, now listen, some people tolerate nightshades just fine. But if you're a person that does not tolerate nightshades and you're having constant inflammatory issues, you're going to want to stay away from nightshades and some of those foods and oxalates too. If you're worried about kidney stones, probably that's most specific. I would say, you know, spinach, for example, has got, got some oxalates. It's got all kinds of benefits, but you want to stay away from that as well. But in terms of something that binds to oxalates, th there might be something, but there's nothing that I know of that doesn't have a side effect that doesn't have a side effect. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. And the only time I recommend binders is if you're doing an anti-parasitic program mm -hmm. or if you're doing a heavy metal detox program. Yep. Th then Agreed. you wanna take these things that are like suction cups, right? But you don't take them anytime around food. You take them away from anything else Correct. so that you still can absorb your nutrients from your foods and the supplements you take. So in general, binders in the evening before going to bed, but only when you really got some toxic crud that you gotta get out of there. It's not something that I'd recommend you take on a regular basis. And regarding the Wheat Rescue and E3 Advanced Plus, Dr. Josh, those are two products I put together. They're enzyme products to break down wheat. 99% of uh, all gluten within 60 minutes, which is really- Amazing. That, that's the key is prior to it coming out of the stomach, it has to be broken down. And they, they work well to break down gluten so it, it Gluten does not activate an inflammatory response or activate intestinal permeability, but I don't know how to bind uh, wheat uh, to escort it out, out of your gut specifically. Yeah, yeah, and Maggie asked about binders for mold. If you're going to do a mold, like Dr. Tom just said, if you're going to do a mold cleanse or a parasite cleanse or a heavy metal cleanse, you can take charcoal away from your meals a couple times a day. Um, and I think that's fine to do, but don't do it for more than a month. Okay. I think you can do it for about a month. And while doing it, you want to drink a lot of water, um, and a lot of vegetables and, and, and keep them going. And then somebody asked about sprouted grains. Can you, they give examples of sprouted grains for, for sprouted grains. I would do rice, oats, and quinoa. And you can simply just go to amazon.com, uh, or your local grocery store and just, or health food store and look up sprouted rice. And you'll find sprouted rice and then put it in like a crock pot or slow cooker over, you know, for like eight hours. And, and there you go. So it's pretty, pretty easy. Uh, Maggie says, can you talk a little about applied kinesiology? And sure. Uh, uh, applied kinesiology is a form of muscle testing. Uh, it was my mentor, Dr. Goodhart, who in 1964 worked on a guy's muscle in his back called a rhomboid muscle. And when the guy came back in a couple of weeks later, he was saying that some of his symptoms of having a sluggish thyroid were better. And that got Dr. Th um, Dr. Goodhart thinking, 
well, wait a minute, I just worked on his muscle. I didn't do anything to his thyroid. And then he did some research and he found the nerves that go to the rhomboid muscle are the same nerves that go to the thyroid. And that sent him on the whole exploration of the world of applied kinesiology. And it looks like voodoo. It's muscle testing at times, but it's like Dr. Josh has spent decades now studying ancient <laughs> uh, traditional Chinese medicine. If he were to put his hand, his fingers on your pulse like this, he could tell you what happened to you four years ago in terms of your health. Sometimes, you know, some, some of those guys, if you're, if, if, so some of those people that are very good, really are able to, I, I know a man who's unbelievable. He's a Chinese medicine practitioner from Israel and just what he can tell from feeling your pulse is just, it's, it's yeah, incredible. Exactly. And, and you'd say, yeah, right. Whatever. No, but really, really it's accurate. Muscle testing applied kinesiology is the same way. It's outside our realm for most people to understand. But if it helps, it's a diagnostic tool. And it's really in the hands of the practitioner as to how effective it can be. There's lots of thousands of practitioners of applied kinesiology over the last 40 years that I know of, uh, tens of thousands actually, that use that as a diagnostic tool. It can be very helpful. And it also can be way out in left field. It depends on the practitioner. It always depends on the practitioner. Hope that helps a little bit. Oh, let's see. Kim says, I need help with diet for adrenal fatigue after menopause. I have cut out sugar, gluten, almost all dairy, and I still can't lose weight. I feel better, but can't get weight loss, and I'm always hungry. I can only handle juicing a few times a week and don't do intermittent fasting because of adrenal fatigue. So, so I would say if you have adrenal fatigue, um, the diet should be what I mentioned as the diet earlier. It should be uh, for your carbohydrates, it should be sprouted rice cooked in a crock pot for a long period of time, so over for eight hours, you know, so rice, it should be berries, like blueberries, raspberries, that sort of thing. Lots of cooked vegetables, and then some wild organic meat, wild caught fish, a little bit of chicken, grass fed beef, that really should be your diet. What I just shared right there, okay, is perfect. From a supplement standpoint, I would consider taking uh, number one, I would take ashwagandha. Um, you also might take, there's an herb in Chinese medicine called Ramania. That's a really, really good one for adrenal fatigue. So I would do ashwagandha with Ramania. You might also consider the herb Don Kwai. That is the other one. It's known as female ginseng. Those are the three herbs I would take. Uh, ashwagandha, Ramania, Don Kwai. And then the other big thing is you, you just need to, you, you need to spend more time. Typically, this is related also to being in a fearful state or in Chinese medicine, they call it a state of survival, where you're always trying to just survive and get by. You have things going on all the time. And so you want to get out of that state of fear and start building your faith and hope in the future. And so, you know, positive meditations, you know, reading the Bible, personal growth books, just reading things that are really inspiring and uplifting. You need to get yourself in that state. If you watch the news, I would completely stop watching the news. Uh, you know, if you want to check once a week online or here and there, but it actually puts you in a state of fear. So anything that gets you in a state of fear, you've got to get out of that fight or flight response is critical. And for exercise, walk, just get used to just walk regularly, walk outside whenever the weather is nice, but just start walking. And when you can, you can just slowly amp it up 3% a week, 1%, I mean, just a little bit. But I think if you follow that advice, that's, uh, that's going to help, help the most. It's a great overview. Um, I, I would add one component to Let's the go, yeah. well, to the walking. I fully agree with. Get a pulse <laughs> monitor. Get a pulse monitor because body language never lies. And when you get a pulse monitor for exercising, the formula is 180 minus your age plus or minus five. 180 minus your age plus or minus five. If you've been diagnosed with a disease like hypothyroid or rheumatoid or psoriasis, any diagnosis, it's 175 minus your age, plus or minus five. So whatever that number is, for example, if you're 60, so 180 minus your age is 120, plus or minus five would be 115 to 125. And you set your pulse monitor for that range, 115 to 125, and you start walking. 
And when you're in your pulse range, the pulse monitor is silent. Man, you're doing great. You're aerobic. You're burning fat for fuel. When you start getting tired, and if you're at the same pace, your pulse goes beep, 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 beep. Oh, my pulse is at 132. Why did it pick up? Oh, my muscles must be getting tired. So you slow down and you slow down to stay in your pulse range. And if you're too slow, it goes beep, beep, beep. Oh, my pulse is only at 102. I better pick up my pace a little bit. And so your pulse monitor is your coach. And it's silent when you're in your pulse range. It beeps, beep, 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 beep. If you're going too fast, beep, beep, beep. If you're going too slow. And the rule is you never argue with your coach. Never, because body language never lies, right? That way you're never gonna push too hard and injure yourself or fatigue yourself. If you've got low functioning adrenals, your pulse is gonna, maybe your range should be 115 to 125. And when you start walking, it's going beep, 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 beep. Well, wait a minute, I'm just starting to walk. This can't be too much. Body language never lies. Slow down your walk. Well, then I'm just gonna walk really slow. Well, if your pulse is in your aerobic range, that's the best you can do right now. And what will happen over the weeks is you're gonna to have to walk faster to stay in your pulse range because you're getting healthier. But that way, this way you've got a coach. And so everything Dr. Josh said about the food selections and the herbs and for exercise, just include this part in your exercise. Uh, Debbie asks, does lion's mane mushroom help with dementia? Yes, lion's mane. In fact, lion's mane is an incredible, incredible mushroom. It, it, it's been known to help uh, something in the body, actually, it's called uh, NGF, nervine growth factor. So it actually helps create new and healthy neurological tissue, which is hard to do. So yeah, lion's mane has been shown in clinical studies on humans to improve memory and focus. And also it is going to help support Alzheimer's and any neurodegenerative illness. In addition to that, I really like ginkgo biloba. So doing a combination of lion's mane mushroom and ginkgo biloba together, phenomenal. And then a few others you may consider too. I, I think those are the biggest two, lion's mane and ginkgo. But along with those two, I think, um, I think CBD oil and turmeric both have some anti-inflammatory properties and some neuro supportive properties that I think are, are great as well. And then with that sort of diet, this is a diet, I'm not saying full on keto, but you want to remove the carbs and consume a diet that's higher in fat, pretty much, you know, doing avocados, olives, wild caught salmon, walnuts, coconut, all of those types of foods along with some wild organic meat and lots of veggies and berries. That's the ideal diet for, for the brain. That's a great overview. I agree with everything you said. And Debbie, I would also add, you have to address where's the dementia coming from? That there's a fire in the brain called inflammation that's mm -hmm. triggering killing off brain cells, killing off brain cells. And changing the diet will reduce the inflammation but if you've got, if you're living in a moldy house and that's the trigger, you're breathing in mold right up your nostrils, straight to the brain, and that's the gasoline on the fire, you got to get out of a moldy house. Or if you've got a bacterial infection or a viral infection, you know, there's over 246 studies, just Google herpes simplex one and Alzheimer's. And there's 246 studies on herpes. So you've got to deal with the herpes as when you're changing your diet and taking these supplements to build stronger brain cells, but you also have to stop throwing gasoline on the fire. And so you have to explore, find a practitioner to work with to explore how is my brain on fire and where's it coming from? Everything Dr. Josh just suggested will help to put the fire out, but it may not be complete. It may not just be foods that was triggering the fire, right? There could be other environmental triggers that are setting it off. Uh, Faina says, why do I get bumps on my scalp under the hair? You know what? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a more difficult one without a specific diagnosis. I would say anytime you've got something on the scalp or skin like that, in Chinese medicine, it's known as actually more of an immune issue that starts in the colon. 
Okay, so the colon is where it typically starts according to TCM. Uh, emotionally, it tends to mean that you've had something happen to you in the past and you haven't been able to let go. It could be you had a trauma in your life with a, uh, you know, it could be loss of a, loss of a loved one. Uh, it could be a divorce. It could be uh, unforgiveness. You've had somebody that hurt you in the past and you haven't let go of it. So in Chinese medicine, this is a really strongly emotional issue typically. So I would really work through, whether it's with a counselor or a pastor or a friend, but just in, in yourself, you know, really thinking through, has there something happened in the past that you have are still living in the past that you need to let go of and move forward with your life and create a vision board and think about your future and purpose. Those things actually all help with skin issues. Uh, even that issue that you're sharing with me. And from a dietary standpoint, you want to make sure you're consuming, uh, I would say foods that are more, uh, in Chinese medicine, they call it yin, okay, yin foods. And so actually, there's an herb black cohosh, which is good for this black cohosh. And then um, lots of vegetables and fruit, you know, will, will help that as well. Um, they're more, you could look up yin foods, Y-I-N, would, would help that according to TCM. You know, people can understand, if I use a reference about, in the, in the last question, dementia, and if you're living in a moldy house, well, you're breathing mold and the spores are going right up into the brain and your immune system is fighting the spores, and so you get this inflammation. And people can uh, kind of wrap their heads around, okay, that kind of makes sense. Most people can't wrap their heads around, you've got an emotional issue from the past, you need to let go. And they can't wrap their heads around that until they understand when there's some trauma that we lived through and there's still some of the thoughts about it, it's creating hormones. And those hormones in our brain called those stress hormones are triggering the inflammation that's causing the symptoms you're getting. So it's not that you need a therapist because you're wacky in the head. Rather, you may need a coach to help you work with this history in your memory banks that's triggering these stress hormones. It's, it's yeah. hard to wrap your head around, let go of that trauma. You know, it, and I used to say that a lot, you know, in, uh, or in one way or another, but it takes patience and time to deal with that. I really like Dr. Joe Dispenza and his messaging. You know, he's got this phrase that he says, um, it's time to stop living out of your memories of the past and rather your vision of the future. And so as Dr. Josh is talking about vision boards and you know, making pictures and, and writing down how you want your life to look, those are very powerful tools that can help quite a bit. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, Allison asks, uh, what does cordyceps for lung conditions, if, what dose for cordyceps for lung conditions if you were elderly? A uh, thousand milligrams a day typically. You could do a thousand, yeah, I would say about a thousand milligrams. Kim asks, do herbs only grow one season? My thyme and oregano don't look good anymore. Can they grow indoors in the winter or will they survive outdoors above freezing? You know what? I, I'm probably not the best person to ask about that. I do know, uh, again, we've grown herbs in our house and they'll grow quite, several times a year. I know that they sprout best in certain times and very late spring and through summer and even early fall. But I, I uh, yeah, I, I can't uh, answer that super accurately. Neither can I. I've just learned recently there's some lettuces. You cut the outer leaves and then more lettuce keeps growing uh, from it. And it can grow year round. I thought that's really interesting. I wonder mm -hmm. if there's uh, the roots go deeper. And so the leaves change flavor over the course of months or wow. something. That, my, my brain went uh, with that one. Uh, Doug asked, Hey, docs, would love to hear if you recommend wearing anything to reduce 5G affecting our bodies. You know, I, here, here's, here's my advice, I think, with a lot of this is focus on the majors. I, I think that 5G and a lot of this radiation uh, and a lot of these waves, you know, they can add up over time. 
But I, but I actually think that, you know, negative emotions of even watching news and living in a state of fear is far more damaging to our bodies. And so, you know, for when I'm read, read as well, it's more of a time thing. Like my wife and I, we have a timer in our house where Wi-Fi turns off from like 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. So we have no Wi-Fi in the house. And you can actually buy some rolls of things that you can put in certain areas of the house that block Wi-Fi and different types of 5G and other types of uh, other types of uh, different types of radiation. So there are definitely things you can buy. But for me, my mindset is very much, I'm going to eat very healthy. I'm going to foster very healthy emotions, live a healthy lifestyle. And then some of those things like, you know, wearing certain crystals or doing other things that can maybe, or having the certain magnets and things on some of these devices that can block 5G. I really don't know how well they actually work. I know some people say they do and they may, but for me, my mindset is I would just encourage everybody focus on the majors. If you can eat healthy, have a healthy mindset, healthy, active lifestyle, I think that will go further than thinking about some or, or focusing on some of those things. I, you know, I think that's a brilliant answer. I'm just, I'm smiling because I'm imagining a cartoon of someone who is wearing all of this anti 5G stuff and they're sitting there watching the news about who got murdered today. You're right. And which right, one's yeah. going to have, you know, it's like, which one's going to have more of an impact on you? I can tell you the news is a hundred times more toxic than the 5G. Not, I'm not saying 5G isn't bad and doesn't have side effects. I think it does. But I think it yeah. is pales in comparison to wa watching the news and being in a state of fear. So I think that your recommendation is a very good one. It's a priority system. And the first right. priority, the, the, the top priorities are get, get your head on straight on how you're taking care of yourself. That's the first priority. When you start going down the line, of course, you want to protect yourself from this radiation if you can. Uh, of course, it, it's not going to hurt there's this harmony bracelet thing. And my, one of my staff got this thing and she put it on and she said, the ringing in her ears reduced dramatically within a short period of time, like an hour, two hours. And so we took a look at it and I tried wearing it. I said, oh, it feels all right. You know, I didn't notice much. Marzi put one on and she said, oh, that just feels comfortable. And she just felt a little bit, and she noticed an impact on her day. So I mean, they seem to work. I always talk about with cell phones. I've got a Pong case, P-O-N-G on my cell phone. Now, why? Because it blocks radiation. Well, what does that mean? Well, my car is an Acura. And as I walk up to the car, my, my key sends a message, here he comes, and the lights on the car turn on, the dome lights inside, and the little lights by the door handle shining down in the ground. They turn on as I walk up to the car, which is kind of cool. You know, if it's nighttime, it's nice that happens. But sometimes I walk up to the car and the lights don't go on. I say, what's wrong with this car? Oh, 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 of course. Because I'm holding the key in the same hand as my phone. And when I change hands, the lights come on immediately, meaning the key can send its message to the car that I'm coming and the lights turn on. But if I'm holding it in the same hand with the, my phone on a Pong case, and I don't, know, I don't know if this is the best one, but I know it works. I know it's doing something to minimize the amount of emissions coming out of this phone or coming out of the key when I'm holding the same hand. So I'm going to err on the side of caution. I'm going to always have a Pong case on my phone or something similar because I use this thing all the time, right? And so... But it's a priority system. And Dr. Josh is absolutely correct. Get your head on straight first. There is no reason in the world to be watching the, the, the local news. And, and as he said, you know, once a week, you, you want to check in, see what's going on. Okay, great. But it's not going to change the quality of your life in general. So, okay. um, Amanda asked, to detox chemicals and heavy metals, what herbs would be beneficial, please? Yeah, to do not talk heavy metals, I, I mentioned this one earlier. I think milk thistle is going to be very high up on the list. I think from a diet standpoint, mostly vegetables, a little fruit, and things like bone broth, I think those are going to be the most detoxifying and supportive. So along with milk thistle, I like uh, chlorella or, or chlorella, chlorella or spirulina, but I like milk thistle and chlorella. I would put those up on the list. And then there are other herbs, dandelion, 
is going to be on there. Um, uh, there's an herb in Chinese medicine called buplerum that has a lot of detoxification benefits. But I would say, you know, milk thistle and something like chlorella are, are, are two of the best. Okay. Uh, Christine asks, Dr. X, should all cancer tumors be treated the same in natural remedies? What is promising for SCLC? You know, I, I think, you know, different tumors actually are related to, remember the emotional component, cancer, of all medical conditions, cancer absolutely has a, all conditions do, but cancer as well has a huge emotional component. If you have lung or colon cancer, it's that living in the past issue. You've had, whether it's unforgiveness or a hurt and you have not let it go. Brain tumors is not being able to think outside of the box as you've had a way of always living life and think things should be very black and white and they're not. Um, breast cancer, if it's on the left side, it's related to uh, you've given too much of yourself. So the breasts are seen as two things or known as two things in Asian medicine. They're for nourishing a child and they're for sexual desire. Those two things, the left side is much like it. Think about the mom who is given and given and given and given. And she volunteers for every last thing and brings the kids to soccer practice and works, makes their all these things. And she literally has no time to ever recharge her own battery. That's breast cancer on the left side. The right side is not being in touch with your Femininity, femininity, actually, according to Chinese medicine. Uh, if it's issue like prostate cancer, that's lack of excitement and fulfillment in life is you've just kind of done the same thing always. And you don't have this purpose or this passion, these things you're driving towards. So I could go on and on and on, but all of it, these issues are related to emotion. So number one thing to heal cancer is focus on emotional and spiritual healing. Pray to God, read the Bible, go in and ask for prayer. Um, all of this, changing those negative mindsets into positive. That's the number one healing thing you can do. And then after that, it's going to be a diet that's rich in vegetables, berries, really vegetables, berries, and a little bit again, bone broth liver as, a, as an organ meat is very good for cancer as well. And then in terms of herbals, galangal and turmeric are probably two of the top ones. In terms of mushrooms, uh, maitake, cordyceps, reishi are all going to be very high up on that list. Essential oils, frankincense and myrrh. Um, but I would say those are some of the best. Sometimes zeolites are good, good if you also need to do some detoxification. Thank you for that. Uh, Gwendolyn says, I've been gluten-free for over a year now and have been working hard on gut health and reducing inflammation. Although I've made good progress, I feel I'm missing something. After researching the different types of glutens and grains, I'm now considering going completely grain-free. Would you concur? So I think it depends on the condition you have. Again, I think that certain people do well with sprouted grain rices cooked the way that they consume them and Israel and China and Japan and throughout the world. I mean, J Japan has the longest life expectancy in the world and they consume a lot of rice. They just prepare it a certain way. And then they're eating a lot of other really healthy foods. So I think for most people, they can cons consume not as the main part of their diet, but a portion of grains that sprouted. Now, if you have a lot of chronic inflammation in your joints, in your brain, in some of these areas, for those people, you may want to go completely grain-free and really focus on more of that diet that's going to be just vegetables, fruit, wild organic meat, more of that hunter gather diet. I do want to say this. I do think the paleo diet, when people get off grains and instead they consume a lot of nuts and seeds, nuts and seeds are just as high or higher in phytic acid enzyme inhibitors. And they're actually harder on the digestive system by far. So I think it just depends on, this is where personalized nutrition comes in. In my new book, I really get into this. Nuts and seeds, people will do well with those. If you're what's called a fire element in Chinese medicine, and uh, you have more of a neurological condition or diabetes or something like that, or anxiety, you'll do good with nuts for those conditions. But if you have more of a liver issue, uh, or a gut issue, nuts and seeds are going to be much harder for you. So again, I think it just really depends upon the person there and people can check out my new book, take the quiz. I got all these recipes in there and really go through how to heal the root cause of disease, all this stuff in the book. But in terms of the grains, I think it really depends on who you are. I think for the most part though, almost everybody can benefit of eating gluten-free grains because of really the hybridization of what we've done with grains today. Yeah, agree. Agreed all the way around. I agree on that one. Uh, Mary asks, weird question, but what can I sub for spinach? 
You know, I think there's some other great green leafy vegetables. Four things I'll mention here first, kale, chard, dandelion greens, and mustard greens. I think all of those green leafies are fine and just as good of replacements. One other thing I really like is broccoli rabe. It's uh, got a little bit of broccoli uh, heads on it, but it's actually much more green leafy. It's very, very bitter, but very, very good for the heart. Um, and for your liver and gallbladder. So that's another good option as well. But those are four or five, I guess, leafy greens that I think are good replacements. Fena says, I have Hashimoto's. I juice celery and a handful of spinach and green apple and cucumber and ginger every day. Is it okay? You know what? I think if you have Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune disease, I think doing a vegetable juice a couple days a week, especially if something like celery and greens and turmeric, you're going to be fine with that. But you actually juicing for autoimmune conditions isn't as good. For cancer, it's better. But for autoimmune disease, you're better off actually eating a lot more cooked foods. In that case, I would actually focus more on eating soups, chicken bone broth soup, miso immunity soup, stews, like eating foods like cooked vegetables and meat. If you have autoimmune disease, have two thirds of your plate cooked vegetables, whether it's steamed or baked or whatever, and the rest of your plate wild organic meat. And then you could throw a little healthy fat in there. But for the most part, loads of vegetables, little meat, easily digestible, digested fruits like blueberries and pears, but really grains and nuts and seeds and beans and vegetable juice and all those things. Those are not going to help Hashimoto's and they're not really going to help, um, autoimmune disease, generally speaking. So, and Dr. Tom, I got to wrap up here in a second, but yeah. Sure, yeah, of course. Fully agree. Fully agree. Uh, we, we know autoimmune diseases um, have a huge component coming from the microbiome. And when you're juicing, you are not feeding the microbiome because the microbiome lives on fiber. You want to you wanna feed the good bacteria in your gut, and that happens with fiber. Okay, so we, um, Dr. Josh, I mean, it just goes so fast. You know, it's like we just started, right? I know. I know, I know. It goes, and we, we just go on for hours and hours. Well, thank you so much, everyone. The, the link is here to the book. Order the book today. And after you order the book and after you've taken a look at it, put a comment back on Amazon underneath the book. That goes so much further for people who are thinking about ordering the book you know, they'll, they'll look at the comments. And if you take a couple of minutes, you're really helping this guy here get his message out to the world more. So order the book, learn from the book, learn about the different uh, types of diets that might work for you, depending on the questionnaires you fill out, you fill out there. And then after you've read it, there it is, there it is. Yeah, it's great, thanks. And after you've read it, put a comment on Amazon. Well, Dr. Josh Axe, thanks so much for being with us. Look forward to the next time that we can be together. Awesome, Dr. Tom. Again, thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody. Again, I want to encourage you to check out the book, too, because I want to say this. Dr. Oz wrote the foreword. He rarely writes these. Read it. He loved it. We have so many people who have read it and just said, you know what? I had this disease. I started take. I, I started. We sent this out. Uh, the pre-books to a lot of influencers on Instagram and celebrities and everything, they started using it. The reviews have just been so powerful of people reversing autoimmune disease, healing their bodies, overcoming chronic health conditions. So I want to encourage you guys, and it's on sale right now on Amazon if you just search Dr. Axe Ancient Remedies. So Dr. Tom, I want to say thanks so much for having me and uh, God bless Real everybody. Real pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.